Hey guys, it's MJ and what we're going to be doing in this video is going through portfolio management. So Mass has given us some slides and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking through the slides. So this is the agenda. You can see we actually have quite a lot to get through. So feel free to pause the video at any time, take a break. Um, but I would advise maybe, you know, after each topic, maybe taking a five minute break or, or if you've got the stamina to go the whole way through, then fantastic. Um, but yeah, on the agenda, we're going to be talking about portfolio management. We're going to be looking at investment styles, index tracking, active management, core satellite approach and anomaly and policy switching. So like I said, there is a lot of theory in this and yeah, let's, let's just jump straight into it. So this first slide that they've got here is they're saying, what is it? You know, what is portfolio management? And essentially, portfolio management comes after the investment strategy. So the investment strategy will be something as simple as saying, you know, we want to put 30% in stocks and we want to put 70% in bonds. You know, that, that is, that's the overview. That is your, your investment strategy. Then your portfolio uh, management is, well, okay, how are we going to go about getting those 30% of equity? How are we going to go about getting the 70% um, of bonds? And there's various ways that you can do it. There's, there's the whole active and passive investment style. Um, there's growth and value that's specifically around uh, stocks. I mean, momentum and contrarian and rotational, those are all um, around stocks and shares. But top down and bottom up, these are two approaches that you can apply to, to the various other asset classes, such as property and bonds and, and so forth. Okay, so let's look at uh, investment styles. It's starting us off with active managers. So it says active managers seek to actively identify mispriced securities, which can then be traded to generate excess returns. It requires an inefficient market makes sense if investor believes that there are mispricings to be exploited and if a manager who has the necessary skills to exploit such opportunities can be identified. Now it, it's, it's very interesting when you come to this whole active manager versus passive manager um, in the sense that if everyone was passive there would be inefficiencies would crop up in the market but if everyone was an active manager then those inefficiencies would close out you know that's that is the one way of seeing it but it's got this thing yet saying you know an inefficient market uh, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent convinced by the statement uh, requires an inefficient market uh, what we're gonna actually be showing you I guess we can actually talk about it now is a lot of this notes or a lot of this theory is built around you know America and England and and countries that are very well developed and they have a very sophisticated uh, stock exchange and they've got various uh, industries. But as soon as you come to, to Africa, and I guess South Africa you, you know, falls under this, this bracket as well, is we're a country that doesn't have as many industries as America and England. You know, our stock exchange is pretty much dominated by you know, mining and resources and financial uh, services. I mean, if you look at some countries like Nigeria and Angola, they're dominated by the resource industry, which means that if you had to go passively and just passively invest, you're going to be really concentrating your assets into certain um, you know, sectors. Whereas it would be wiser from a diversification point of view and a risk management point of view to actually take an active approach in these countries that have got you know a domination of a certain industry. So in this sense, it doesn't matter if the market is inefficient or not. Sometimes you want the active manager to actually give you the diversification and risk spread that is you know applicable to your investment um, goals. So I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with the slides that they have here, saying that it requires an inefficient market. Um, that is not always the case, especially in you know a South African context. Um, one interesting thing to note, though, is that there is this belief that the more third world a country is, or the less developed it is, the more inefficient the market is. 
it's it's a dangerous assumption to make and it's maybe one that if you do want to state that in the exam maybe do a little bit of research behind it see if you can find a, a paper that can back up that statement um, I mean it it's it could be true but it, it could also could not be true and that's also a big lesson to to learn when it comes to these these F subjects is to question the notes because it requires an inefficient market not not always true when talking about South Africa and those type of things. Okay, so passive managers, um, what it's saying here, involves selecting securities that best meet investors' objectives or make up investors' benchmark portfolio. These securities are held passively and only change in reaction to a change in objectives or benchmarks. Appropriate if investor believes that market is efficient, this implies that one cannot generate returns in excess of market returns without taking on extra risk. Um, I mean, the, the one thing about, say, the passive manager, which does get like a little bit awkward, is let's say we want to go 30% in shares, 70% in bonds, and then the stock market does really, really well, you know, and our, our value, let's say, doubles. Now we have, you know, as our total portfolio, we have a much heavier concentration in equity than we did with bonds. Then do you rebalance, um, you know, to keep it in that 30-70 ratio, or do you break away from your investment strategy? You know, what, what do you do? Because from a passive point of view, you buy onto these assets and saying that you only change them if there's changes in the objectives or the benchmarks. Um, also, I mean, involves selecting securities that best meet investors' objectives. I mean, passive manager, it's more like buying into the index. So South Africa, we have this thing called Satrix that tracks the top 40 shares. So a passive manager will say, okay, let's buy, or let's put all our money in the Satrix top 40. Whereas the active manager will say, well, in that top 40, there are some shares that I don't think are going to be performing well. And there are some shares that I think are going to be perform even better. So the active manager will say only choose 20 of the top 40 and invest his money that way. So that, that is one key, key thing to note about passive and active managers. Um, now, okay, now, there's, now they're talking about, you know, around the stock. So let's say 30%, we're going into equities. Okay, which equities do we choose? Growth stocks are stocks that are expected to experience rapid growth of earnings, dividends, and hence price. So growth stocks are normally your technology shares. You know, if a new app comes out or a new type of social media like Facebook or a Twitter, um, or even like, say, biomedical uh, you know, a new drug company that does experimental stuff. Anything that has got, doesn't really have a history. So growth stocks are normally your, your young companies. Um, they're very capital and R&D um, intensive, but they, they're expected to make, you know, massive amounts of money um, if they, you know, unlock or they solve what they're trying to do. Um, so they're very exciting, very risky and they're either going to be great or they're going to bomb out. Whereas your value stocks are more of your boring stocks. They're more like your utilities. They're more like your companies that have been established for a long time. Companies that have, you know, they've got a product. They make their product well. And every year they've got a certain amount of sales and they get their money. And they don't spend a lot of R&D. They pay high dividends. And... They're, they're not going to, you don't buy the stock and then sell it a week later and double your money. You know, there's not going to be, be that excitement or that possibility. Um, but they're more of a stock that you buy and in maybe five or ten years time, you might see a little bit of growth in their value. But you would have got quite a lot of money in return with the dividend yield. So this is kind of like the, the mature or the safer um, stock to buy in. Um, this is more the crazy speculative uh, stock to buy in. And certain managers will try and take a different philosophy on either one of these. Okay, now they're talking about momentum, contrarian, and rotational. Um, let's start off with rotational just because it kind of follows on a little bit more logically from the previous slide. And rotational is when sometimes you're buying value stocks and other times you're buying growth stocks depending on where the market is in its big cycle of life. 
So let's say we're going through a little bit of a recession, then you might want to put all your money into value stocks um, because it's safe. But let's say the, the economy is booming and you know everybody's becoming rich quickly, well then it might be, make sense to take advantage of the situation and put your money into the growth stocks. Um, then there's these two things called momentum and contrarian, and this is the, they're complete contradictions of each other, which is very interesting. Uh, you know, it, it shows that finance, uh, uh, that's what I do enjoy about finance, is the fact that you can have these two situations where the one is going to be, um, you know, saying we must go this way, and the other one saying we should go that way. Uh, so what momentum says is that if, we, if a share starts going up, Okay, if a share starts going up, ooh, I have gone one slide too forward. If a share starts going up, then momentum says that because the share is going up, all the other investors are going to be like, wow, this share is so great. We also want to buy into it, and that's going to further push the stock up even more. Then even more investors are going to be like, wow, the stock's doing so well. They're going to put even more money in, and there's just going to be momentum, and it's just going to keep, keep rising. Contrarian view is that the market overreacts. So let's say there's a good news story and the share goes up. Um, contrarian view is that, well, that the market has overreacted and that this value, the intrinsic value of the share is now overpriced and therefore it's actually quite good to short the share. Whereas the momentum um, investor will say, oh, look, good news, the price has gone up. This is a buy sign. Contrarian will say this is a sell sign. And the thing about the momentum investor is that he believes uh, that everyone will start buying a share if its value goes up. But if there's a lot of contrarians in the market, then his belief is going to fail. But now what's interesting is the contrarian investor, he believes that a lot of the investors are momentum buyers. In the sense that if a lot of the, uh, the investors are contrarian, then the prices are not actually going to overreact. So where this gets very interesting is which one is better depends on who are the other investors. And if you look at, like if you read some of the, the history of finance and, and hedge funds and all of these type of things, there's some traders who wouldn't play the market, they would play the other traders. So if every, and I think Warren Buffett also talks a little bit about this, you know, be greedy when other people are fearful and be fearful when other people are greedy. And the idea with that is, you know, if there are a lot of momentum buyers in the market, then it is actually quite weird because if there's a lot of momentum buyers, then it means both methods will work. If there's a lot of contrarian investors in the market, it means both of these won't work. Well, when I mean they both will work, momentum will work in the short term and contrarian will work in the long term. But if there's a lot of contrarian, then neither of them will work in the short term or the long term. And if that is confusing, well, welcome to finance. This is the great contradiction between momentum and contrarian investors. Okay, let's look at investment styles. There's something called the top-down approach. So top-down approach is when you think of it, think of it as a bird coming down to land. So a bird says, well, you know what? Let me first choose which city I want to land in. Okay, I've decided on Cape Town. Okay, now I'm landing in. Okay, which, um, which area of Cape Town do I want to land in? Oh, I want to land in the waterfront. Then it comes down to the waterfront. Okay, which building do I want to land on? Okay, I want to land on you know, the F&B big building there. And then it says, okay, which part of the roof do I want to land on? You know, that is the top-down approach. You start at the top and you slowly come down. So from an investment point of view, you would say, okay, I want to invest in securities. What type of securities? Um, equity securities. I want to invest, therefore, in the stock market, the top 40 shares. I want to invest in the financial um, sector. Out of the financial sector, I want to invest in the banks. Out of the banks, I want to invest in F&B. So you can see how we, we start off very general and we come, become more and more specific as we go down. Whereas bottom up is basically think of you running around the street saying hmm the F&B share actually looks great that's a great value I want to buy that oh look at this telecoms look trading at a great price let me buy that and then what what you start doing is you start buying shares at the ground level 
And then when you go up, you say, okay, look, we've actually got a lot of influence on finance and we have a lot of influence in the telecommunication sector. So the one you, you know, coming down like the bird and the other one is you're running around on the ground uh, making your choices. Interestingly, a lot of the time an active investor will go bottom up, you know, looking around for what, what share has been mispriced and then building up their investment portfolio that way. Whereas the passive investor will generally look at the top-down approach, say, okay, we need so much of this, let's get so much of that. And I mean, a passive investor might even stop at, say, the financial sector and buy an instrument that covers all of the the shares in the financial sector, um, rather than even going all the way down to the granular level. Um, and Joe, yeah, what? Let's let's see what the next slide is. Index tracking. Um, so they say this is a form of passive investment. It doesn't have to be passive. It could be could be an active investment. I mean, if you're tracking, say, uh, you know, the volatility index or some of these more crazy indexes, it could actually be a form of active management. So it doesn't have to be a form of passive investment. Um, there's three main ways to do it. There's full replication. Uh, which is you know holding all the securities in proportion to index weightings. Um, so yeah, the idea is that let's say you've got the top 40 shares and you you go in and you actually physically buy all 40 of the shares depending on their weight. So if F and B is the biggest company, you're gonna buy the most of F and B with regards to weight. There's a lot of calculations you need to do. Or what you can do is you can do a sampling um, or replication where what you do is you just hold certain, like a little sample, you know, very much like statistics, you hold a very a little sample that acts similarly to the full replication. Um, this is gonna be a much cheaper way because you're not gonna have you know, such high dealing costs, but you're not gonna get the perfect match with index tracking, which does leave room for you know, additional risk. Um, so that is one thing that as an investor, you'd want to you'd want to consider, and that would very much depend on your clients. I mean, if you're a massive investment bank, full replication is something that you can do, whereas if you're a small boutique uh, hedge fund, um, a sampling uh, would be, you know, make more sense. Then there's also this whole thing that you can do is synthetically, you know, replicating index using derivatives and cash. That does open up a lot of other problems though. I mean, derivatives, do the derivatives exist? What is their liquidity? Um, what is the marketability? Can you get them? And what are their dealing costs? It actually might be more expensive and there might be even additional operational costs and people that you implement to put them forward, stuff up and you know you lose a lot of money. So there, there are there's pros and cons to, to each of these types of index tracking um, techniques. Um, what is the next the next slide? Okay, the next slide we're talking about the advantages of index tracking. Um, reduces risk of underperforming the index. Yeah, lower dealing and research costs. Okay, this, this is important, is the, the research cost. Well, think about it. As a passive investor, you just say, I want to buy the top 40 shares, okay? You just go and you say, I want to buy the top 40 shares. You, you're basically, your only research is saying what shares are in the top 40, and you either buy them or you buy you know, a synthetic instrument to give you that. Whereas if you, the act of managing, say, well, I think 20 shares are going to, you know, outperform the other 20 shares, that's a lot of research. That are, that's a lot of late nights, you know, coffee, drinking, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, oh, like, like, is this share going to go up or is that share going to go down? Let me do my PE analysis. There's all this. You're going to have to imply, uh, employ, you know, some graduates to help you with the business analysis. There's all these, these costs that come into it. Like I said, if you're a big massive investment bank, these costs will be quite small. But if you're a boutique hedge fund, again, these costs can be quite substantial. So I think that's one of the biggest advantages of index tracking. Um, they say it's appropriate if market is believed to be efficient. Uh, tracking well-diversified indices in share fund is well-diversified, thus reducing specific risk and volatility of returns. Remember, this isn't true all the time. Like we said before, if your um, country that you're dealing in is, you know, an African country, South Africa, the indices will not necessarily be well diversified. There has been times in South Africa's history where the indices have been dominated by the mining uh, companies, which means you've got a 
overexposure to the commodities and if you went and you you know did your passive index tracking thinking oh look at me i'm not going to be taking on that much risk you were actually increasing your specific risk and you could have decreased that sorry about that you could have decreased your specific risks if you had gone the active approach so be careful this is this is a big warning don't just learn your book work off by heart because if they're talking about you know the question context is that you're in an african country doing investment there and you say oh we're going to reduce the specific risks by just you know going into the index that would be seen as incorrect okay so don't don't make that that silly mistake and always think about you know what is the market that you're in um appropriate if market is believed to be efficient i mean well we can have a a huge conversation over market efficiency is the efficient isn't the efficient uh, i think yeah there's a, there's a lot of literature on that topic there's a lot of intellectual debate pro and against um you know that that belief so let's look at the disadvantages chance of outperforming the index is reduced well yeah that's kind of like obvious full replication involves forced buying selling when index constitutes change and fragmented portfolio yeah i mean like if a share falls out of the top 40 you have to go and then sell it which is probably not the best time to be selling that share specifically if it's you know there's that whole momentum approach going where a share falls out of the top 40 because it's been performing a little bit badly Everyone goes, oh my gosh, the share is terrible. We're also going to sell it. All the other passive uh, managers say, well, it's not in the top 40 anymore. We have to sell it as well. And then you have to go and say, oh, flip, we also have to sell it. So what you're basically doing is you're depleting the price of that poor share. You know, it falls out of the top 40 space and its share just get, uh, value gets wiped out. So what, what could actually be quite interesting, this is for you for you guys who want to maybe become hedge fund managers, it could be quite interesting to look at the shares that are, you know, in the 39th, 40th position on the index and watch them and maybe short them. You look, okay, I'm only talking speculation here, talking, we're going a little bit off topic, but there's a little bit of speculation here and that is you, you short these shares because if they fall out of the index, their price is going to be smashed if the market is made up a lot of passive investors. So again, you need to understand the other players in the financial market in order to really profit off of it. If there are a lot of passive managers and a share falls out of the top 40, its price is going to be obliterated. And if you have a short on that, you're going to make a lot of money in that situation. And then what you can do, if you want to be really clever, is after it's dropped out of the top 40, its price will be smashed. Its price will be incredibly low, below its intrinsic value. That's a great time to buy it. And even if it never comes back into the top 40, you've got a share at a very good price, which should give you quite a nice dividend yield. Then also, if it does get back into the top 40, everybody has to buy it again, and its share value is going to you know, shoot up again. Now, see, when you start thinking of things like this, it's very difficult to say, oh, the market is efficient because if a share falls out of the top 40 or not, it shouldn't have such a massive impact. If a share goes from 40th to 41st, it should not experience such a massive drop that we do see. But anyway, we're going a little bit off topic. Um... So yeah, let's let's check it out. Uh, full replication involves forced buying, selling. When index da 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 da, we spoke about that. Resulting strategy may pay insufficient regard to investors' objectives. Yeah, like that's the thing is that because index tracking is seen as to be less risky, less risky, less reward, you may not get your objectives. Um, not that hot on that that point, but I don't know. Let's see what the other one may prove difficult to find an appropriate index to track. Yes, so there are different indexes. There's, say, the top 40, um, but then there's also something called the SWIX, which is based on, you know, the social responsible, or, you know, this, you know, that type of, yeah. You know, there's, there's different indices. So it's difficult to choose which one do you want to actually track. And I guess that does make the strategy of when one falls off, you know, 
does this value deplete, does it fall off all of the indices or just which one? But I mean, I guess a big thing here or a, big, a good example is say in America, they've got something called the Dow Jones and what is the, the New York one called the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ from a theoretical point of view is better than the Dow Jones. But we do see that the Dow Jones is very popular and is quoted a lot. So it's actually quite interesting, you know, which is the appropriate index to track in that sense. Um, but that's more of like an American, I guess Japan also has that. They have the Nikkei and they have the Topex um, indices, which are also, again, two competing ones. South Africa and, I mean, the other African countries, I don't think that would be too much of a problem. Because, um, like I say, our indices are kind of the same. They were built a little bit later, so they are more efficient. Um, and then this last one may be difficult to accurately track chosen index. That That's a weird diff thing that they've put there. Because, I mean, say in South Africa, we've got, say, the Satrix instrument, which makes it very easy to track uh, your chosen index. In America and Japan and England, they will have products as well that can accurately track the index. So I guess this is maybe more for, you know, African and, and other third world countries where their financial market might not be as sophisticated. Um, so yeah, I guess, or I guess if you want to have like quite a, like you want to track the index of financial companies, it might be a little bit difficult. But, but this is more a third world problem, which is interesting. Why are they putting third world problems and then, but they, yeah, yeah, these slides. Okay, anyway, let's let's rather move on. Um, active management pros and cons. Okay, active management pros and cons offers the possibility of higher returns than market, limitations of peer group risk, difficulties related to selecting outperforming investment managers, timing change to lineup of active managers. Okay, so what, what this slide's basically saying is that if you go with an active manager, remember, as, as an actuary, what you're basically doing is you would be saying, we need to put, say, 30% in the stock market, 70% in bonds, and then you need to decide, you know, should we take that 30% and just invest it in a lovely little index, or should we hand it over to some active managers and let them invest our money for us? Um, the active managers can, you know, will be able to get around the diversification problems of the passive strategy in a third world country, but they will have you know their expenses their salaries their nice fancy offices their beautiful car that they have to pay for so they are quite expensive but they do offer the possibility of higher returns you know they could be really intelligent i mean imagine if you chose warren buffett as your active manager you know you'd be laughing all the way to the bank you'd be making a lot of money but there is the possibility that you choose the wrong investment manager. You choose some guy who, you know, maybe just woke up one morning and said, like, hey, I want to be a hedge fund manager. And then you give the money to him, he doesn't know what he's doing, and you actually, you know, lose money, um, you know, and there's this, you know, you, you lose money compared to everybody else. There's peer group risk. Everybody else does better than you, um, which it's a weird risk, this one. I mean, the, you can have, you can underperform the group, but overperform the market, or you can underperform the market but overperform your group. And this is where it gets quite interesting because it might actually be better to outperform your group and underperform the market than the other way around because it means that the money that's going to those other people then comes towards you. This is if you're an active manager. Uh, you can then get that, that more, more money to do that type of stuff. But the biggest problem as an actuary choosing, you know, doing the investment strategy is trying to choose well, which investment managers are the best? And there's all these different little performance ratios that we look at, and you know, but they, they all have their own problems as well. Um, I wonder if we're gonna be looking at those. Um, no, don't think we're looking at those. Okay, so let's just move on to the next slide. Active investment mandates. Okay, active investment mandates. This is a multi-asset or balance mandate. Managed funds invest across a variety of different asset categories and will take decisions on weighting across asset categories and stocks within each asset category. Um, specialist mandates specialize in particular asset categories and employed to manage funds invested 
in that asset category only. Okay, so what basically this is, is when you go to an active manager, so think of it, you're the actuary, you've decided on your investment strategy, or you decided, okay, we're gonna go active manager, we've decided Warren Buffett is the best active manager that we wanna to go to, so we knock on his door, we now sit down with old Warren Buffett, and now we need to tell Warren Buffett what we want him to do. We can tell Warren Buffett, look Warren Buffett, we only want you to invest in financial stocks. Um, or we might say to him, we only want you to invest in growth stocks. Or we only want you to take a contrarian outlook. So this is where it becomes quite interesting because, you know, I mean, you could go to the active manager and be like, you know, here's 100 million, you know, make me rich. But for your overall strategy and for your portfolio construction, you might want to give them a specific mandate or a specific set of rules and instructions on what they should do and what they can't do. And this becomes very interesting because this kind of stuffs up the whole portfolio, um, you know, those little indicators like, is this active manager good or is he bad? And you might look at his, you know, return on investments and all these other things and say, this guy's, you know, just terrible. But it could be unfair because his mandate might have might has limited him or might have restricted him from purchasing say this new stock that was going to do absolutely amazing but it was against his mandate to purchase it so he couldn't purchase it but all the other active managers purchased it so he loses out on the group risk and his performance measures are bad meanwhile he actually did nothing wrong it was just the silly mandate that was passed on to him or actually that mandate might not have been silly at all it just perfectly you know coincided with this portfolio strategy so this is where finance does get blurry it does get difficult to try and determine you know, which manager is the best. And this is quite interesting. Some active managers might actually say no to your money if you give them a mandate that they're not comfortable with because they know how important it is um, that their performance uh, measures are correct and are looking healthy. But you could, job. There, there will be some active managers who will specialize in a certain mandate, who, who will specialize in just a group of shares and then you know like, okay, if we need insurance companies on our portfolio, you know, Bob over here, he's dedicated his entire life to just studying insurance companies. Let's go to him, give him a specialist mandate to say only invest in insurance companies. You know, Bob will be like, that's great. But if you go to Bob and say, I only want you to invest in mining companies, Bob's going to be like, dude, you know, go, go somewhere else. So it is very interesting once you, you know, and this does make passive investing a lot more attractive from an actuarial point of view because you just have to say, okay, I want to track that index. Whereas if you've got an active manager, you have to choose which active manager to go with and then you have to sit down and talk to him about the mandate and there's all these other things that you actually have to go on with. So it's more expensive, it's more time consuming and it does require more judgment. So it is important to keep that, that in mind. Um, there's something called the core satellite approach. Basically what this approach is, it's saying, instead of me going to say a hedge fund manager and saying, here's a hundred million, I want you to put 90 million into safe stocks or track the index. And I only want you to go aggressive with the 10 million. Um, you know, that, that, that's quite a silly thing to say, because what you're doing is you're paying the hedge fund manager commission or management fees on that full 100 million. Whereas it would be much better to go to the hedge fund manager and say, here's 10 million, go crazy with it. And then you go and you put the 90 million yourself into the, you know, the stock market uh, index tracking passive, passive approach. So that 90 million would be your core and then the satellite would be the 10 million. And then you might actually say to the 10 million, 1 million, I want you to go into high growth stocks. Another million, I want you to go into crazy technology stocks. One million, I want you to go in, you know, contrarian approach. You know, you can then have this whole satellite approach and you can then give these small amounts to guys who are specialists and let's see if they, yeah, majority managed on a low cost. Yeah, so they do mention, the big benefit is that it's, it is low cost. Um, active managers employed to provide increased performance in respect of balanced fund. But now there is, there is a disadvantage, and that is 
if you go to like say the best hedge fund manager and you tell him you're only going to give him 10 million he might say well that's that's not enough you're not worth my time whereas if you go to him with say the 100 million He's going to be like, oh, come in, come inside, you know, have a cup of coffee, welcome to my office. You know, he's going to do like a whole song and dance for you. So there is a disadvantage to going the core satellite approach in that you might not be able to attract the best active managers. And I don't think they have included that as a point in one of these slides. Okay, anyway, I think we've got five, five more slides to go. So well done if you guys are still hanging in there. Remember, you can take a break whenever you want. Um, you know, maybe have a little quick cup of coffee and then come back to this video. Um, next, we are talking about anomaly switching. Okay, this, this is quite crazy. Anomaly switching is switching generally involves buying one stock and selling the other. So bonds are held to match liabilities. Switches are done to enhance returns through active trading. Anomaly switching involves moving between stocks with similar volatilities, takes advantages of temporary anomalies in price. Relatively low risk strategy, profits likely to be small. Okay, so what this basically is, is you would actually write a computer program to do this for you. So what you would do is you'd say, okay, when this measure goes above this, or when this falls below that, um, that creates a little bit of an anomaly. We want you to then sell and then buy straight away back into this other company. And then when these small little variations change, we want to continuously doing this buying and selling, um, taking advantage of these small anomalies. The more people who do it, the less these anomalies will last for, and it will slowly start to close up to the point where the amount of money that you're spending in the transaction cost of selling and buying, you know, the tax and the broker fees and all of that that has to go through it, actually starts eliminating the, the extra return that you get from this exercise. So that's why profits are likely to be small and they're likely to decrease with time. Um, risk is also quite a low risk strategy because you're kind of still in the same asset class. You're just flicking between these, these two things like here. Yeah. It, 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 it is more of like an obscure thing in finance, um, but yeah, it is something that you would, you would leave to the machines to do. Um, otherwise, you'd be spending your whole life at the computer, you know, clicking, 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 clicking. It is something that, yeah, a machine can do better than a human. But the whole trick then is to give it the right set of rules and instructions to, you know, to perform. Um, okay, yeah, they're talking more about anomaly switching. Three techniques of identifying anomaly switches. Compare current yield differences between two similar bonds to recent average values to determine if one of the bonds seems cheap or dear relative to the other. Compare price ratios in similar fashion to yield differences, allowing for any difference in coupon levels. Use price and yield models. If actual price or yield differs from model prediction, then a mispricing exists. So you can see, very mathematical, very like technical and all that type of stuff. So it is something that you would have a machine um, that would continuously calculate these various averages and ratios and then perform the trade for you um, on its behalf. I think in like in Wall Street, they the people actually fight to be as close as possible as they can to the actual stock exchange, just so that the wires connecting to the to buildings is just a fraction smaller, which saves them a microsecond, which can give them a slight advantage in performing these these trades before everybody else does. Uh, because remember, this is a machine doing it at light speed. Um, and yeah, so they try and get their offices as close as possible to the stock exchange in order to take advantage of this. I mean, this is something, yeah, like I said, the machines are kind of doing it. It's very much finance, financial mathematics and quant and, and all that type of crazy, crazy stuff. Um, okay, now they've got something more policy switching involves taking a view on future changes in shape or level of the yield curve and moving into bonds with different volatilities. If yield is expected to fall, switch into longer dated, more volatile stocks, potentially high risk, high return approach, need to consider matching. Okay, so policy switching is more of the long-term game, whereas anomaly switching was very much a short-term game. Policy switching is you think, okay, this country that we're invested in they're actually, you know, they're, they're going to elect the government that's going to be completely inefficient or they're going to go into a war or something terrible is going to happen, which means 
the yield of their bonds is going to skyrocket and the price of the bonds are going to you know fall flat so what we're going to do is we're going to get out of long-term dated bonds and rather going to short-term dated bonds with uh, and then there's also the flip strategy oh no this country's got a great new government they're going to go through you know they've lacked quite a lot of regulations there's going to be a big economic boost let's go into the long-term bonds so this is very much an active investment um, approach to the bond market. Um, so not only can you do active investing around shares and equity, but you can also do it on your debt instruments. It is quite a different ball game. It is a little bit more difficult. You do have to take a more of an economic uh, outlook. You do need to understand politics and world history and current affairs and all the latest trends going into it. Um, but what we are seeing here in the notes is that it is a high risk, high return approach. So it is quite interesting because normally, like they say, the investment strategy is we want to put 30% in equity, 70% in bonds. The one way to think, you know, people might say, okay, regulation might say we have to put, you know, so much in bonds because that is considered, you know, safe. One way to beat that regulation is then say, okay, we'll put 70% into bonds, but we're going to go into this high-risk trading policy switching strategy. So our bonds portfolio is actually a little bit more aggressive than the equity, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of the regulation saying, you know, so much has to go into bonds to, to you know, give a little bit of security or stability to the, the total investment. So... It is quite crazy, and, and that's what they are saying here. You need to consider matching because by doing this, you will be mismatching from your liabilities, which does introduce the high risk, but does give you the opportunity to get the high return. Okay, we have two more slides to go. Um, let's just see what they are. Risk management and anomaly and policy switching. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit more about it. Three factors that can be used to identify policy switching opportunities. Volatility, duration calculations, together with forecasts for changes in yields, can be used to estimate percentage changes in value, and so to determine the area of the market that will give the best returns. Examination of reinvestment rates between two bonds of different terms may indicate areas of yield curves that seem cheap or dear, suggesting future possibility yield movements. Examination of forward rate spot rates may reveal apparent oddities in term structure that give rise to policy switching opportunities. Whew. Okay, I think the big things to, to look here are reinvestment rates, spot rates, and volatility. And like I said, this is very technical, very numerical, a lot of calculations, best left to the machines. But it is, it's important because as an actuary um, or someone in financial engineering, you will develop that algorithm or that formula to give to the, the machine in order to implement and I mean, this is possibly where we are going to see a little bit of a rise in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is basically machine uh, trading with a bit of a Bayesian approach saying, do this, if that's not working, change it. And what will be quite interesting is a machine will be able to learn what is the optimal um, you know, way to trade and stuff like that. So this is actually... It's exciting, but from a technical point of view. And it is something where I think actuaries have a bit of an advantage over other financial, um, you know, like the CFA and the accountants and stuff like that, is because we do have an appreciation of statistics um, and we do have an appreciation of mathematics, which is going to be applying quite drastically in this area. So... That is a, it, it's an exciting area, it is a scary area, but it is an exciting area, is if you can make a machine that not only just trades on a set algorithm, but actually starts to learn and changes how it, you know, trades, you might, uh, you might be in for, for a bit of a win. Um, but yeah, that is anomaly in policy switching, and then basically, the slide ends, why is the slide ended? But basically, they're talking about risk management, saying bond portfolios often help to match specific liabilities. That's, and that's the whole thing, that anomaly policy switching kind of breaks that, that whole matching uh, philosophy. Uh, the following techniques can be used to control bond portfolio risk. Um, 
immunization, you should remember that from CT1, stochastic asset liability modeling, that's like CT8, value at risk calculations, again CT8, multi-factor modeling, again CT8. And that's, yeah, the slide actually finishes here. Um, but yeah, these are just like the mathematical, and I mean, as this is F105, so there will, or there, there's a possibility of there being mathematical questions. So they're not normally that difficult though, so, but yeah, it is important that you go through some numerical examples on your own, checking out, you know, can I do immunization, can I do these, these various things, and, and yeah, you should be fine. But that is the end of the slide. So I think, uh, yeah, I think the video is done. Well done for, for hanging in for the whole, whole duration. And yeah, I'll see you again for, for the other videos that we, we make around this. And remember, study hard and yeah, best of luck for the exams. Thanks, guys. Cheers.